Surprised to hear all these beautiful uh, different angles that nicely come together. Um, and uh, of course, we, can, uh, uh, we also have to have a look at the economic side or at least the management side. Uh, I'm not a specialist in uh, P2P platforms, let's be honest about that. Uh, I do work together with uh, some people, right, so also here in the room. But uh, my, my, I work basically also on, on data digitalization, let's say, in healthcare, also in agriculture. So most of my examples will be from that area, but I also have some examples of the energy sector. So I'm going to focus on how digital technologies are changing the business models in uh, lots, of tech or lots of industries, but also uh, energy, also healthcare, and so on. And then if you want to make sure this, these business models can be realized, you have to work with ecosystem management. And that's relatively new in economics and maybe also for you. And I hope I can show you a number of issues that, both, uh, that for all of us are very important. No. Yes. So a misunderstanding, and maybe also among, among some of you, is that um, innovation will come from technology. And there are a lot of engineers here, and so I have been working with engineers before. And so but let's have a look at Thomas Malone, what he said in 2015. Some of the most important future innovations will not come from new technologies, but from new forms of collaboration. And so you see that already also in the P2P platforms, uh, it's not the technology only, the advances in the technology only that are going to help us, but also you need the new types of collaboration, otherwise it will never ever, although the technology is there, you will never achieve any results. So, and I would say, uh, and this will even be more the case for the digitalization transforming most, most if not all industries. Right? So digitalization is, is really a nice example where, uh, the, um, where uh, collaboration becomes really important. So what I'm going to do in my, my presentation here is we have digital technologies. You probably know them much better than me, so I will not focus on that one. New business models, they lead to complete new business models. Think about P2P trading, right? That's a new business model which was not there available. You need smart meters and all this kind of stuff. So you only can work with new business models if you have the technology. But that's not even not enough. No new business models can only be realized if you have a kind of innovation, manage, innovation ecosystem management. That means that you have to work together, you have to co-innovate together. And so with the whole value chain, let's say, and also let's say you have to know how to manage ecosystems. So if you look basically where the barriers are, the barriers are probably not here, although you are, most of you are probably working on the technology side, but the biggest barriers are there, on the right side. And so the, also because of that, you're gonna have a higher importance for creating competitive advantage, not on the left side, it's not the technology which is gonna give you a, a competitive advantage, it's those people that know how to work together. Right? So it's the, it's the way how you manage the, the ecosystem that's gonna deliver a competitive advantage. And so I'm gonna focus on the barriers to change, and I'm gonna focus on eventually, but because that's still my work going on, um, how you can develop an effective ecosystem, ecosystem strategy, because that's probably, according to me at least, the bottleneck, the bottleneck is not on the technology side. Good, um, there, are some, there, are, there are some books if you're interested in, this is more about platforms, two excellent books about platforms, if you don't know them, you would like to focus really on digital platforms, great books. If you want to focus on ecosystems, I would advise you to read Atner, and he has a book of 2012, and the last book on the right side is um, a book from 2021, a very recent book, right? So that's just for your information. Um, I need, to I need to introduce you a few concepts because I'm not sure that some of you know what uh, business models is. So let me just rephrase what a business model is. A business model describes how you, create who you create value for your customer, how you deliver that value, and how you capture that value. Now, that's a lot of words again that probably need some explanation, so let me, go, let me chop it up. A firm or an organization, right? So the, the question is who we are focusing at here. But a firm or an organization has to have a value proposition for the customers. What do I offer to you? If Apple is selling you an iPhone, what is the value proposition? What, how can I create value for you as with, with the iPhone for you? Right? So that's, or for instance, for Nespresso, what is Nestle selling us? Right? What can you do with a customer with an Nespresso machine? Then, of course, uh, you are the customer, so the value creation is for you. It's, uh, for the Nespresso is a fresh cup of coffee in a minute, right? So that's what you, what you get offered. 
buy uh, as a customer buy uh, Nestle. And then uh, the value delivery uh, is basically what is necessary at, ne at uh, Nestle to create that value. So you need activities, you need assets, you need skills to do that. And then finally, the value capturing, that's also important. You only can have this value creation if the company makes a profit or if you're an NGO, that means that you should be economically sustainable. So if you're not economically sustainable, it doesn't make any sense to create value, okay? So this is just concepts which are gonna use, but just making sure that you are on board. A second thing is we work with a platform. Think about P2P. Electricity trading is a platform trading, right? So it's a digital platform. What is typically for a digital platform? Well, you have a platform and usually you have an owner and the owner controls the IP and also the rules. Yeah? It could be, for instance, in the Android, it could be Google, right? And you have, then you have the providers, that's basically the interface. So the interface is your Android phone, but it can be an HTC, that can be a Samsung, can be anything. Hmm? Keep in mind that, for instance, in Apple's case, the iPhone both are together, right? So it's Apple having the IP and it's Apple also delivering you the iPhone. And then you have what typically a an, an platform is doing, it's connecting you, it's making, allowing you to make transactions. What are the transactions on the iPhone or on the smartphone? You are the customer and you consume apps, the services of apps. So what a, what a platform is doing is bringing together producers and consumers, or in the case of Uber, it's bringing together a driver and a passenger, or in the case of, um, uh, let's say, um, a dating site, is bringing together men and women, right? But it's always there to, to, um, to improve or to smoothen, let us say, or to facilitate transactions, okay? So a platform business model is something specific. Why? Because you have at least, at least two types of customers. So that's very specific. In a product, if I sell a car, you are my customer. But in a platform, Apple has at least two customers, the apps developers, and you have to make sure they are happy, otherwise they will not make apps for you. And you have the customers and we should be happy, otherwise we will not buy an iPhone. So you have two customers, not one. And that's the difficulty, that's the difficulty I want to make sure you understand. Okay, so far, this is just introduction, just to make sure you're on the same level, right? And we can you know, go ahead with understanding, um, let's say, what I want to say. Um, the electricity trading, and yeah, that's a, a slide that uh, Mehdi made for me. Um, so peer-to-peer -peer electricity trading is an opportunity for to, uh, for, to trade prosumer surplus electricity with other consumers and prosumers. So this is a new platform. This is where you're gonna be a, pro a producer, yeah? Uh, and you, you can also be a consumer, but you're gonna make sure that the excess, uh, excess electricity from one household goes to the other household using the grid. That's basically what it is, very simple. Other people can explain it much better. That's my simplified understanding of a P2P platform, okay? But this is a platform, this is a digital platform because it, all the data, hey, you need the data, it's basically uh, about digital data that you, have to, that, you, that you have to deliver that service, right? So let's see who are the actors. And then you see already the problem propping up, what I want to show you and that I'm gonna show you with other examples too. First is, okay, we have consumers, prosumers here. We have representatives, brokers, retailers, or suppliers. We have aggregators, DSO, TSO, whatever, right? Now let's have a look. If we switch from the current system, like say the existing, uh, the existing systems, to uh, P2P trading, then you see that prosumers here, Let's see if that works, yes. They see an opportunity there because they can make money. Or they can at least service somebody else and eventually making money. So here there is an opportunity. Value can be created and value can be captured. Okay? So they will be happy. They will try to push in that direction. And maybe they're gonna organize themselves into big groups to do it together, right? But here we have the DSO, and if I understand correctly, now let's, let's have a look at suppliers. Suppliers have a problem because the more we do with P2P platforms, the less they can sell. So they lose. Will they be happy to push the P2P platform? By no means. So we have among, if we can call it that way, we have already one resistor, one group that's gonna resist the change. Second, look at the DSOs. DSOs have, or if you have a P2P platform, you're gonna add complexity for them. 
right? It's already difficult for them to switch, let's say, from a vertical, from, let's say, the old system where you have a top-down system where you also have to nowadays a bottom-up system. So the complexity is already there, but we're, we're going to add additional complexity. And they also have to open data because you only can work if the data which they own, or at least which they have access to, or opened up with all the parties and so on. So two problems, and maybe more problems for DSO uh, to enter, let's say, or to push to do, let's say, P2P platforms. So what is the problem here? Even though that we would have all the technical issues solved, so an ing an engineers have been doing their work, even though that this has been solved, even though that the legal aspects would be solved, we still have big problems because the main partners that we need, like a DSO you really need, will not help you in moving from here to a system that is based on P2P platforms. So whatever you do, nothing will happen. All your work will, work, will be work for nothing. So my point is, you have an economic side, you have a technical side, you have a legal side, and probably we have to look at an integrated exercise in order to move on. Okay, so let me go one step further. One word I still have to explain is an ecosystem. So why is that platform-based P2P trading, why is this an ecosystem? Well, let's have a look at what Atner says in 2017. The, an, an ecosystem is the alignment structure of a multilateral set of partners that need to interact in order for a value proposition to materialize. Now that's a lot of words, but the first thing is we have a focal value proposition, so we're gonna create value for somebody. Here it is the prosumers, right? for, the pro for the producers and the consumers, so we can create value. You need a multilateral set of partners, so quite a number of people, and we have been seeing them here, right? So here they are. You need all these people, or at least most of these people, to get there, to get that far. Hmm? Um, and they need to interact in a very specific way, and they have to be aligned with each other. And you, I have already showed that um, they are not aligned. DSOs will be resistant, other people will be pushing, so they are basically looking in two different directions. And ecosystem management is, can we make sure that everybody is going in the same direction so that P2P platforms can be realized the right way. That's ecosystem management. And so we have an application here of ecosystem management. So I'm very sorry to tell you that I'm not mainly working on, eco on electricity although, or, or P2P trading, although I do a number of works with uh, a number of research with uh, uh, Medi, but uh, uh, I will show you other examples which are uh, completely parallel, work, in, uh, work exactly in the same way. Right? So we have, I focus on important, econ on important economic sectors. Uh, sorry, I, I focus, I first have to explain this here. I focus on digital healthcare, precision agriculture, and then uh, clean energy, but that's, uh, I didn't do a lot there, so I, that's my intention to do that, I didn't do a lot there. So economic, very important economic sectors like large value chain inefficiencies, which we also see in energy, of course, right? Um, data are crucial. We see that also in, in uh, P2P trading. And we also have it, it's very important because traceability, sustainability, prevention, and so on become very prominent levers of value creation. And think, for, think for instance here, traceability is very important, right? Also in, in energy. Uh, sustainability is a very important thing. More green energy, more, more use of P2P trading would help us in, 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 in building, let's say, a larger market share for sustainable or let's say green energy. Hmm? So here we solve also global challenges like food supply, reliable and affordable healthcare, global warming and all this kind of stuff. They are uh, complex ecosystems, so like for instance in healthcare it's very complex, but also in, in agriculture it's complex. And digital providers don't always have the power to change the business process. So that's an interesting one because normally in economics we try to, we are convinced that digital providers can push the ecosystem. We look at Google and we see that Google has been doing a number of things. We look at Amazon and Amazon have been pushing and, and changing industries. But this here is a regulated market. So you cannot work in the same way. Even big companies like Philips and Siemens are hitting the wall. I will come back on that when it comes to medical digitalization of, of, the, of medical data. They cannot organize, let us say, the whole, the whole industry. And so regulation comes in there and so public authorities uh, all are there as partners. So that's a, cru that's a crucial element. So all these things will come back in the next, um, in the next slides. 
what are we talking about? So I think a, 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 practice, a practical example is much better than a lot of theory. So how does it look in, in practice? I focus here on agri precision agriculture. I hope that some of you understand precision agriculture. I will have a look at Sarvio. Sarvio was a brand um, developed by Bayer in uh, 2017, but since uh, they acquired uh, Monsanto, they had to divest a number of things. So Sarvio was acquired by BAS, BASF sorry, in 2018. So the brand encompasses uh, uh, Bayer Digital Farming Solutions, and currently they have like a, a quarter million users in 60 countries. Hmm? So let's have a look at this small video what it does, what precision agriculture is. And you will see just like in the P2P platforms, it's all about data. It's about uh, data as the, oil, as the new oil, yeah? as we have seen data really as the driver for new business models. Mm -hmm. So hang on for two or three minutes and then we come back uh, to the explanation. Times can be tough when you depend on something that's unpredictable as the weather. Every farmer can tell a story or two about Mother Nature. It's so easy to miss the right moment for protecting your crops from dangerous diseases such as fungal attacks. Wouldn't it be great to have proactive crop protection instead of reacting to infections as they appear? Now you can. Meet your new partner in maintaining healthy crops, Xarfield Field Manager. Field Manager is a web-based decision support system that includes three key features to make it easier to do your job while increasing the efficiency of your operations. Field Monitor, all you ever wanted to know about your fields. Current biomass maps helps you identify issues early. High and low performing field zones based on 15 years of satellite data with field power zone maps. Field Zone Maps is a central hub to document and compare the success of all your crop production activities. Spray Timer processes all available data from your fields and uses tried and tested models to closely monitor the risk of specific diseases. It determines the right time for fungicide applications and gives you notice far enough in advance. The Zone Spray feature accurately determines the right dosage. Frequently updated satellite pictures are processed to derive current vegetation indices in your fields, making it possible to calculate the dosage for each zone individually. As a result, Zone Space supplies you with field zone specific maps for T2 applications that are ready to use on your terminal. That's more than just convenient, it also helps you make the most out of every drop of your fungicide. Achieve better treatments for your fields and field zones with Field Manager, the system that boosts efficiency and makes your job easier. All you ever wanted to know about your fields. Spray at the right time. Use the right dosage. Because there's no accounting for the weather. Sarvio Field Manager. Simply smarter on our production. Okay, this is a marketing video, be careful, right? We have seen all the benefits, but the question is now, you are farmers, will you buy it? There's possibly, potentially a huge benefit, right? Huge benefit, but will you buy it? Well, let's see. It shows the videos, but farmers have challenges. What are the challenges? Well, I give you a few ones, right? What is the value here? We have heard a lot of value, but did you hear any figure? A farmer wants to know that if he uses this, he's going to have like 10% better productivity for his crops next year. If he doesn't have a figure, he will not invest, right? That's one. Second, what is the cost? Is it expensive? We don't know. Who owns the data, by the way? Yes, the farmer owns the data, but also, of course, buyer or here in this case, BASF, will have data. What will they do with the data? To whom they share it and so on. Uh, lock in, very important. Can a farmer still buy products from other vendors? Because if I work with BSF for all these products, can I still work with other vendors? Because I might prefer another company for another application, for another field, and so on. Hmm? So what is the compatibility, if I use this data, what is the compatibility with other data from other producers, from other vendors? So all these things have we didn't hear, and this is very, very, very crucial. 
So for other partners, not only the farmers, you have similar challenges, right? So, and uh, therefore you need an ecosystem management and the question is who should lead that? Hmm? So you always have a problem. Different partners will not come together, eh? even like here customers will not buy the product unless you really align all these partners in the same direction, okay? Um, let's have a look at what happened previously and what happened today, right? Previously, there was no such thing like digitalization. You just bought your pesticide, you had your spray machine, and you were just spraying the fields according to the instructions, right? So you had two companies, two products of two companies, that's it, and you just had your, to do your work. Hmm? Today, you have a company called like Fona Photonics, which are looking at the bugs, right? So they are with, with uh, um, what is it, infrared light? They look, with, they look, let's say, over the, or they watch, let's say, the, the fields, right? They get digital data of the fields, what kind of bugs are there in the fields, how many there are, where they are, and so on. So you get nice information, digital information, and then you can go and spray. So it's automated data collection, it's machine learning, it's a digital platform where you integrate all the data, also with GPS data and time data and so on. And then finally, you can do some precision spraying, which is for a farmer very interesting because you can reduce the spray, right? And you have, it's, you're more eco ecological and all these kind of things. So um, you, you save time, so everything is, is, pro, is, uh, is potentially interesting for the farm, right? But now let's have a look at, at the ecosystem again. You still need a pesticide, you still need a spray machine, eh? and that can come from two different companies. So nothing changed there, but then the data come in. The data for Fauna Photonics for about uh, time insect data, or sorry, the real-time insect data. You have geo and time data that have to be combined, and so then you bring this data, you integrate this data into a platform for the farms. Just like we have a platform, right, for P2P trading. Then you bring it to the farm and the farmer can use this data. Looks very nice like that way, but then let's have a look at the problems. First problem can be between Phonophotonics and Sarvio. Because Sarvio, for instance, is not allowing Phonophotonics to use the same field data, which is very valuable for such a small company, for other applications. So that's one area of tension. But the biggest problem is here. You have your, if you're on the platform of BISF, and you still have a John Deere machine, John Deere tractors are also working on a platform from John Deere. And the two are not compatible, not yet, and therefore a farmer has to choose. Will I choose, will I work with John Deere, or will I work with BISF? But the two together don't work. So the value for the farmers is really low. So we have a number of advantages, but we also have a number of challenges. And as long as these challenges are not solved, this technology, which is really promising and also from a society point of view, very interesting because we can reduce spray and all these kind of things, so it's very good for, for, uh, for the environment. Well, this technology is not moving on, as long as these problems are not solved. And these are only a few problems, there are more problems than that. Okay? So you see the ecosystem is really an issue. Now let's go to healthcare very quickly. This is something I got from Philips. Philips is, uh, is already from 2014 working with a so-called health suite uh, um, platform, right, where they basically can integrate all the data from healthy living, so your smartwatch or your, health, or your, your iPhone, your sport data, whatever, right, your jogging, your jogging data, uh, the diagnosis in hospitals, the treatment data, uh, home care, basically everything can be integrated. Uh, have a look at the current situation, do you know your records from a hospital? Probably not, right? You have main hazontate in Belgium, but that's basically, it's not 100% correct, but you can, if you put it black and white, you can say oh, that's a, a bunch of PDF files, right, which you cannot use very well, right? So you should, it's not really a record where you get an insight into your health situation or your, your health history, let us say, okay? So if we could combine all this data, if we could integrate them, you see already the benefits, right? First, less errors, because a lot of errors in medical data are made by manual entry, right? By copying, eh? because here we have data from the hospital, and we don't, for instance, we don't have this data here, for instance, from home care, or not integrated with the data from the hospital. So that means that for the moment, we still don't integrate, let's say, if, you, if we have old patient treatment, we don't integrate this data yet into what hospital uh, surgeons should know about you when you leave the hospital. Uh, they, if, you have, if, you do, if, the modern, if the monitoring would go much faster and better and you would have real-time data once, once you're home, surgeons would see very quickly that still something is wrong with you that you should be called back. And so 
uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, problems would could be prevented. But even more important, why waiting until we are in the hospital to start working with data? That's what we are doing today, right? We are still in a sick care, not in a healthcare, but in a sick care system. We wait until somebody is sick, we create the data, and then of course, then we see, okay, what's going wrong and so on. But we do have data here. Something, if you have smart watch data, smart watch data or, or iPhone data, whatever, you, a lot of these apps can indicate that something is wrong with you. And so instead of waiting until you're sick in the hospital, you can work on prevention. And we should work much more on prevention by integrating data. So this is not the case yet. Hmm? We don't have such a system yet, but you see that, for instance, uh, Tencent and Ping Ang and so on in China move in that direction very quickly, and we are lagging behind. So there's also issues, of course, with personal data, medical data and so on, security issues, yes. But um, the value is there also, right, in combining data. Okay, digital platforms do play a major role in such an ecosystem, so data-driven ecosystems, but they have very specific characteristics. Um, if you would go into the books that I have been, uh, that I have been showing you, uh, let's say, a few slides ago, you would see that these uh, platforms are typical two-sided market platforms. Think about Uber, think about Airbnb, where you combine, let's say, uh, somebody who has a room and somebody who needs a room, right? And so you, you, this is a, a matching, a matching uh, platform. So these transactional platforms, right, like Uber and Airbnb can, are very simple and very standardized. An Uber drive in Belgium, or if you have it in Belgium here, or in Greece, or um, in, in, you know, in New York, is virtually the same, because the platform determines how you transact between a driver and a passenger, right? So very standardized. But let's have a look what we have here, right? In this kind of more complex systems. In healthcare, for instance, you have to combine not two parties, but you have to combine wearables, apps, providers, insurance, home care, regulators, and so on. In precision agriculture, you have to combine farmers, manufacturers, uh, machine manufacturers, sorry, chemical companies, digital uh, technology startups, and so on. So it becomes much more complex, much more difficult to bring these people and align these people together. And then more important even is that transactions are not standardized, but they become personalized. And think about the P2P platform again. What you're doing is personalizing your service because you have an excess capacity at your home, which is different from your neighbor. And because of that information, you're gonna have a, a, a personalized service, let's say, by delivering um, um, electricity to somebody else, right? Or to other households and so on. So it's very personalized. And so instead of a, a standardized transaction, you have a personalized service. And that's the case in energy market, that's the case in healthcare, where you really can go to almost personalized healthcare, right? So based on your DNA, maybe not today, but later on. And in agriculture also, you see what we have seen in the movie or in the video is basically a personalized approach for each field or each part of the field. Yeah, because you don't do it, uh, you don't go unisono, let's say, over the whole field, but you're gonna, you're gonna spray more or, the, or spray less fertilizer hmm, uh, according to the needs, right, of that specific part of the field. So personalization is very important, and therefore data integration and close collaboration between the different players becomes very important. Then the second difference is scaling. Traditionally, we see that such a platforms like Uber and Airbnb can scale very fast because they are asset light, so and they go like global, right, in a few, in a few years' time, let's say in a five to ten years' time. Here, it's just the opposite. Um, let me go to agriculture. If you want to have these this solutions from BSF sold to farmers, you have to convince farmer by farmer to move on. And that's way too slow. In healthcare, you have to convince health, the hospital per hospital to, to, to work with, digital, with a digital healthcare system, right? like, the, like the health suite of Philips. That goes very slowly. Also energy, if you want this kind of P2P platform, you're gonna have to convince provider per provider, customer per customer, and so on. So they can go very slow. So decision-making is also very complex because the one that can, that can benefit from it, like a, like a surgeon in a hospital, uh, is not necessarily the one who is making decisions. It's the hospital director who is making decisions. So that can complicate a lot of things. Regulation also, usually regulators can facilitate the introduction of digitalization, but what we see nowadays is in many markets that uh, legislation is still delaying or, or increasing, let's say, the status quo, or let's say, improve, um, 
they're keeping the status quo in place. Hmm? Let's call it that way. And then also, can we emul emulate variety? So is it possible to accelerate that kind of slow process here? Yes, if you organize a large group of people into, let's say, associations. And in the Netherlands, for instance, you see already that farmer associations are very important in, um, in, in increasing the speed, let's say, of the adoption of the technology. And I think also here, like energy collective purchasing groups or energy, so uh, customer groups and energy market also can accelerate that kind of process. And probably they do already. Hmm? So maybe the most important thing then is that uh, digital technologies only can have transform uh, transformational impact on uh, an industry if the business processes can be changed. And I'm gonna illustrate that with an example from uh, the Hustle University. It's a, an, it's a research project. So we, we have uh, the facts black on white. There's a research paper and so on. So uh, published research paper. And you see here, um, we have, uh, it's about hypertension monitoring for pregnant women. It's a very simple thing. So it's about monitoring pregnant women about, their, about hypertension. Uh, nowadays, it's probably very standard, but in 2014, it was uh, still very novel. And um, so what it was, it was just a project with five hospitals in, in Flanders. The objective was to reduce the problems with hypertension among pregnant women. And it was a simple monitoring project where a pregnant woman is taking her blood pressure two times at home, right? And that uh, the values are sent automatically to the hospital. A midwife is controlling it, right? And only if there is an abnormal value uh, of the blood pressure, then she had to go to the, to the gynecologist. Of course, there's a control group where there's no telemonitoring, where the old system works, where you go every week, every, two, every week, like two times to the hospital to measure your blood pressure, and that's it. Hmm? So the results are phenomenal. The results, uh, that's also the advantage of having a, a research project. Fewer prenatal admissions, lesser uh, cases of hypertension. The newborns were 10 days older, so less premature babies. Fewer birth inductions, major cost reductions, for, because like an average um, uh, delivery was like 2,000 euros less in 2016. Um, and then um, the problem is that this technology, although it looks like everything is, is uh, so the results are fantastic, you would expect that this would roll out across Belgium, right? In all hospitals in Flanders or in Belgium. Well, um, so far, nobody has been really accepting it. Nobody has been really adopting it. So why we don't, sorry, why we don't see that? Well, because the benefits are for particular groups and the disadvantages for other groups. Look at the patients. I mentioned already for the patients, it's less complications, less risk for the mom. She can stay at home, so it's comfortable. Babies are on average 10 days older and so more healthy, and there are less birth inductions. So all positive for the mom, all positive for the consumer here. Also the government can, can, uh, can have, uh, has a positive effect because the RISIF, so the Belgium um, insurance, insurance company uh, or insurance organization, sorry, I should say, it has significant cost reductions and also less healthcare cost afterwards because the mom is healthier, the baby is healthier. So it's, it's, be, it's beneficial for the patient, it's beneficial for the government. But now look at the hospital. First, a gynecologist. How are gynecologists paid in Belgium? Per visit of the patient. Now here you re reduced the number of visits to the uh, to the visits that are really necessary because you only invite a, a pregnant lady when she really has to come because there's something wrong. So they lose income and they will resist with a norm. So for very good reasons, gynecologists are going to resist that kind of new digital technology. And the same happens for uh, hospital directors because they want to have a high occupancy rate in the, in the neonatology, neonatology department. Um, but and, and here, because of the, the improvement in the, in the monitoring, you will see less cases, right, of people that are arriving in the neonatology department. So less beds, less budget, less income for the, for the hospital. And again, you have a second group who is against the implementation, who is against the adoption of your technology. So the technology may be there. It may, be work, it may work perfectly, but still, as long as you have actors who have good reasons to resist the project, they will not be implemented. Uh, I, will, I will skip that for the for, uh, uh, sake of time. And now we can go back to our adoption chain risk uh, uh, and, and uh, with the DSOs here. So if we go to, um, if we go for a P2P trading platform, you see that prosumers or consumers can gain. 
But the supply side, let's focus now on distribution, so on the DSO, you see that DSO may have a lot of problems. What kind of problems? Well, DSOs are crucial. You cannot, you cannot take them out of the equation. Right? So that's, that's one point. If we could take them out of the equation, it's great. But they are there and we need them. So we have to see how we, what we can do. First is open data to third parties. Maybe they are not allowed to do so. So the, the government has to, or at least regulators have to come in and change the rules how to open data. Right? Because you only with sharing data with third parties, right, you can uh, organize this kind, this kind of activities. Regulators or policymakers can revise DSO re responsibilities or change their roles. And probably they have to because DSOs will tell you today, we cannot do that because that's not our role. And the role is determined by the government. So here you see that they have to, that the government has to get into action. Come to ecosystem-wide solutions about electricity security. Also very important because you don't want a, you don't want a blackout, right? So you have to make sure that this is all in in, pay, in place. Sorry, in place. And part of the value should be transferred to the DSO because if a DSO is suffering um, investments or risks, you have to compensate one way or another. So as long as they don't have a net benefit from moving to digitalization, moving to a P2P platform, they will always resist it. So basically you have to look at the weakest partner. Here we have a weak supporter and you have to look how you're going to help the weak supporter, right? Uh, to, to become a real supporter, to become a loyal supporter for the change. Um, let's see. Uh, let me skip this one um, because otherwise I'm going to be out of... Um, I'm going, to, I'm going to need more time. So one last thing, um, how to orchestrate this change, right? Because now we have the problem and we know that we have to orchestrate all these partners together, like the DSO, the, the suppliers, the prosumers, consumers, right? How you do that? Hmm? And then the traditional, what we see in the literature, in, in the ecosystem literature, is that we usually have like a unipolar ecosystem management. So one company is doing the job. And here I give you the example of the e-Kindle the, or the e-books. Hmm? What, what Amazon has been doing very well is to combine, let's say, the interests of all these people here. Um, they have been working on the hardware with the Kindle. Uh, but the big problem was here with the publishers and the authors. Because publishers know how much they're going to make on, with a book, but they don't know how much, how, at that time, they didn't know how much they could make with an e-book. And so as long as you don't guarantee a certified profit, right, an equal profit on ebooks than on books, they will not, they will not allow you to work, on, to work with a Kindle system. So in order to, um, and Amazon did that very well, in order to make sure that the weakest supporter, right, here the publishers, the more resistant supporter, right, the more resistant actor, would join the whole party, they have been limiting or advantages. Let me give you an example. Can you print, can you print an e-book legally? Because I know maybe some of you are hackers, right? <laughs> um, can, you print, can you print a book? No. Why you cannot print a book? Would it deliver value for us? It would deliver enormous value if I could print like a, a chapter, right? Or I could take a chapter for my students, whatever. I cannot do it. Why? Because this guy, he would hate it. If you print a book, that's one copy less that they can sell. So just to protect the, the publishers, they took value away from us. Right? But also, um, can you copy? Can you send it to your friends? Can you copy it? No. There's no way to copy, let's say, your Kindle, Kindle copy. You cannot copy it and can send it to your friends. So that's, again, the same problem for publishers. And even Amazon went further. Amazon told the, the publishers that it would guarantee for the first year an, the, the same price right, and the same income as the books. So they really went for, um, let's say, the, 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 the price of a book and they reimbursed the publishers for the e-books at the same price as the books. So, they, so that there was no risk at all in terms of income for each copy of an e-book. And at the same time, the price was much lower. The price that we paid was much lower. So Amazon was subsidizing, really subsidizing e-books just to make sure that it could go on and that they became a habit that we as customers would take a new habit of 
um, uh, buying ebooks instead of books. Why is Amazon interested in that? Because ebooks have less cost, no logistic cost, no printing cost. So it was much bigger, much bigger profit for, e for Amazon to do it with ebooks than with books. So this is an example how we, how we see one centralized um, or a unipolar orchestrator. Okay? And you see also here how, one, how the orchestrator is aligning, let's say, the interest of everybody. Here, the publishers were really the resistors, but you, you make sure that they align, get aligned with what we want, right? what Amazon wanted, and they go in the same direction. But here we have a problem. This, this unipolar system is not working. Uh, in in, uh, in um, healthcare, for instance, we see that big companies like Siemens and Philips and IBM Watson Health, they hit the wall when it comes to ecosystem building. Philips has not been building a big, a big ecosystem. The only companies I know that has been doing it so far, Tencent, Alibaba, Ping'an. All Chinese companies, right? Platform companies, by the way, data companies, not medical companies like Philips. Hmm? If you look at Bayer, BSF and John Deere, they develop their own proprietary platforms. And because of the incompatibility, you see that uh, digital farming is going very, very slow, at least integrated uh, systems on a platform. And then you have potential competition with digital giants. I didn't mention that, they will stay out. But also demand side orchestration becomes more and more in fashion. And if you look, for instance, on the farmers in the Netherlands, uh, for sure, when it comes to dairy products, they have been taking the lead. And it's now the producers who are working on a platform of the farmers. So we can turn it upside down too. Farmers can take a lead. So why, for instance, um, people, I will not say in the energy, for instance, why not associations of customers that are organized into big, uh, uh, I will not say companies, but in big, asso big associations, why could you not take a lead in platformization? Hmm? It theoretically is possible. Um, so where to start if you have to want if you want to develop such an ecosystem innovation ecosystem that's where it becomes blurry yeah, and it becomes difficult uh, look for a minimum viable ecosystem very important you don't have to have the whole ecosystem you have to know who you have to start with to have a minimum viable ecosystem and that can start can be can be the start let's say for a, a bigger ecosystem later on okay so don't start with an overall ecosystem that will not work look for customers with the strongest needs right like in a hospital, you never will be able to sell a digital system to the, to the top, but you will be able to find maybe a department who is really in need of a, digital, of a digital solution. And once you have a solution there, it's easier to go to the top. Build momentum with motivated partners, right? So make coalitions of the willing. Very important. Not everybody will, will do it, but with a group, you can push together. You, alone, you cannot do it. With a group, you may do it, and you can create momentum. Hmm? Changing rules, changing regulations. Sometimes the government will help us to change. But then that takes a different view from the government, that takes a proactive stance from the government, which is uh, regrettably not always the case. And then build, eventually, if you cannot change anything, then build projects in the fridge. So everything stays, but you can prove somehow that you can do things differently if you had the opportunity to show what you could do, right? So like for instance, and that's my understanding of the Internet of Energy, for instance, um, this is a project. So it's not, it's not affecting, let's say, the way we work in the energy, in the energy market. But here, some companies have the, or some service companies have the possibility to show what they can do if the data would be available, the digital data would be available. So, and then scaling and speeding up the process by, for instance, uh, upstream, but also downstream. So the demand side, associations making, association consortium instead of individual people. So I think the, the, the role of associations here can be very, very important, right? So because individuals like you and me, although we are prosumers, we have no, nothing to say, we are too small, we have no size, we have no investment uh, capabilities. So we have to organize ourselves into groups that can scale, let's say, that can uh, bring together funding and all this kind of stuff in order to change things. Good, uh, conclusions very quickly, yes. Very quickly, so nowadays we have disruptive technologies that have the potential to transform all industries, including energy, but many more. Uh, you have to take a proactive stance, otherwise somebody will change the industry for you, and then probably not the way you want, but the way they want. Changing your business model, very important, but how to do that? How, how do you want to create value together with your partners? So it's not about you, it's you and your partners that have to create value. And how to make sure that everybody wins. If there's one or two partners that 
trend that that take some risk, extra risk, that have to do investments, that uh, are, are uh, risking to lose money, risking to lose income or reputation, like in doctors' cases, it's reputation, then they will not go. So you have to make sure they are in the boat, and you have to change. You have to compensate for what they lose. Okay. So how to orchestrate? Well, in the literature we have like a number of examples here. So orchestration is usually done unipolar, producer-driven. But I have shown you that probably here in this case, also for electricity market, we have to go with a multipolar orchestration, top-down and bottom-up together, right? Not only top-down. Companies, um, and that's very important. Um, companies try to monetize uh, and try to make a, try to make a living out of owning data. And my point is, it's only through sharing data and combining data from different data sets that innovations and new services will be delivered. Uh, if we look at the P2P trading or new services, let's say new energy services, that can only be uh, generated if we open up our data, for instance, our consumption data, for third parties. Of course, under restrictions, of course, very well limited, right? But still, if we don't share data, there's nothing there. From, for instance, for uh, healthcare, it's very obvious. In healthcare, they want to work with a digital twin. Now, you only can have a digital twin if you have like uh, 50, 50 sources of data combined. Hospital data, your primary care data, you call it. But usually it's like up to 20 to 50 uh, sources of data that have to be combined. You cannot own all the data. It's, it's even not uh, desirable to have the data, but you should have access to the data under the conditions that are necessary. So we have a problem there. So, uh, or should we, so like, who is moving on? Tencent, Alibaba, Ping An. But do we want to have the same in the West? Probably not. You don't want to have Google or your data, right? Which is the case with Tencent, for instance. So, or should we go for a kind of combination of data foundation, connected platforms, and users as data owners? So that's probably a completely different business model, which I have been discussing with, with Siemens. So it's about sharing data to construct a me medical digital twin and what we call in situ rights. So you have the right to access data. You don't want data to be owned. Um, public authorities, that's one of the major partners that comes in compared to, let's say, the traditional ecosystem literature. It's not about the technology, but it's about non-technical ecosystem emerging issues, right? So, and the governments should play a crucial role there. They can do something very important, that is, um, they can level the playing field. They can make sure that everybody gets an incentive to move on. They have to change the role of the DSOs in order the DSOs start rethinking what they should do in the energy market. So they should understand also then the ecosystem development and management. Do they understand it? Do they should be knowledge about digital technology and the disruptive potential in a number of industries there? And they should act proactively instead of reactively, proactively in shaping financial regulatory and legal context of ecosystems. That's it.